You've heard us save the bees, but what about the butterflies, the moths, and even the flies? Yes, save the flies. These are all pollinators that help plants grow and support ecosystems around the world. And they give us food security. Approximately three quarters of flowering plants and 35% of food crops need pollinators to produce. We're talking fruits, vegetables, nuts, spices, and even chocolate. But the changing climate is impacting bee populations and other pollinators. For example, in the last 25 years, populations of monarch butterflies have dwindled from 1 billion to only 34 million. That's a decline of more than 90%. So I want to know, how can we protect pollinators from further harm? Is there a way to restore populations back to what they once were? And is there anything I can do to help? Let's find out. On this episode of Can and Save the Planet, I'm visiting a beehive and a pollinator farm to learn more about the importance of pollinators, their variety. They are a keystone species. They're the reason why our world looks the way it does. And ultimately find out if pollinators can save the planet. There are birds, mammals, and even reptiles that also help pollinate our plants and crops. However, flying insects are the most common pollinators. Obviously, bees are the most well known. But what most people don't know is that honeybees are an invasive species to the US. And while they're important for agriculture, they're kind of bad for natural ecosystems where they have to compete with native bees for pollen and nectar. Another thing most people don't know is that when bees go to sleep, moths take over pollination. In some cases, some species of moths are actually better pollinators than certain species of bees. Then there are flies, which I know are very unpopular. But if you love chocolate, then you have these flies to thank for it since they're the primary pollinators of cocoa trees. All these insects have a symbiotic relationship with flowering plants. Pollinators help flowers produce fruits and seeds, and in return, the insects receive the nutrients they need to survive from the pollen and nectar. Pollination is vital to our flora and our food systems. However, pollinators are dying. The rusty patched bumblebee, for example, has been declared an endangered species here in the US. And in places like Canada, where they once were prevalent, they have virtually disappeared. In places like Brazil, in just a three month period in 2019, 500 million bees died due to pesticide use. Also in 2019, a study revealed that 21 species of bees in Northern Ireland were at risk of extinction. And in India, farmers report that they have noticed there are fewer bees visiting their crops year after year. Wondering what's causing all this? Well, there's evidence pointing to pesticides as the culprit, but there's also the loss of habitat due to rapidly expanding urban planning. As for the third cause, surprise, it's the changing climate. For example, warmer temperatures can cause plants to bloom earlier in the season, which can limit the resources available to pollinators. Similarly, extreme rainfall events can reduce the window in which pollinators can forage for food. And if pollinators can't access enough food, we're going to see a decline in species diversity, reduced colony size, and an increase in local extinction rates. Across the US, plants are already blooming earlier than usual. A great example of this are the famous cherry blossoms. But the decline of pollinators also affects our food. It is already a challenge to feed a global population of 8 billion humans, and a world without pollinators would exacerbate that issue to put it mildly, especially if this planet is projected to have 10 billion humans living on it in 2050. Thankfully, there are people who are supporting pollinators and educating others on how to do the same. I'm visiting the PGA Resort in Palm Beach, Florida to learn more about honeybees and talk to Sierra Malobi, a professional beekeeper with more than 500 honey beehives. She not only loves producing honey, but also spreading awareness on pollinators and conservation. We think about honeybees because honeybees are so important for commercial human food, but we don't always think about all of those other hundreds and thousands of species of pollinators that sometimes are more efficient at pollinating those things. How do you ensure protections for honeybees and other pollinators? Just these little tweaks in our awareness and our practices can really help the diversity because it not just helps honeybees, it helps all of the other native pollinators. Things like trimming the palms during certain times and not trimming them at other times. Or if there's an opportunity to plant a native plant that flowers at different times of the year instead of something else that actually has no benefit to pollinators at all. Another way to protect pollinators, according to Sierra, is to use less pesticides at home or switch to more natural solutions. People are always asking me, I can't believe you keep bees on golf courses. Isn't that really hard on the bees that use so many chemicals? Well, A, bees don't go to turf, which is where they're using the majority of any chemicals, but they're also really responsible with chemical use in these places. I find it's the homeowners that are the biggest problem. 
because it's like the instructions say, you know, mix a tablespoon with a gallon or whatever. And it's like, oh, well, if a tablespoon's good, you know, a cup might be better. So using chemicals according to the labels is really, really important. Although Sierra believes pollinator numbers cannot go back to what they once were, she does believe we can still help current populations thrive. If everybody pulled out something that was non-flowering, non-native, and put a flowering native plant in its place, it would make an enormous difference. To see what that looks like, we're traveling back to New York City to visit Blossom Meadows Farm in South Hold, New York, and talk to Laura Clare, a farm owner who helps raise mason bees to help pollinate her blueberries and the neighboring farms in her community. Laura is someone who went from using honeybees 15 years ago to now only working with local pollinators because they're doing a much better job at pollinating her farm. We have moths pollinating at night. That's why we turn off our lights. And right now we have cellophane bees out in the field. They live in the ground as well as mining bees. And right here we have mason bees. Osmia lignaria is a species that's native to the United States. They pollinate three times better than honeybees do. Unfortunately, Laura is seeing the impact of the changing weather on both her farm and the pollinators that are trying to keep it alive. Everything is waking up earlier. Also, the winters are not as cold as they used to be. Bees hibernate during the winter, and when they don't go in a nice deep torpor, their metabolism is not as slow. And so they're using more of their body fat because their metabolism is faster. It's conjectured that right now those bees do not have as much body fat and then won't have as much energy to pollinate. To help the pollinators with their hibernation, Laura says she puts the cocoons in the fridge to help them properly metabolize and be ready for the pollinating season. What are some other ways you could help pollinators thrive? Take a bee to lunch. Just plant one flower, one shrub, one tree, and you will help so many different species because pollinators mostly just fly a few hundred feet from their nest or their tube. That way your land is a stepping stone and connecting natural habitats throughout your towns. So highly manicured lawns, not good. You need to have natural areas for the bees to live in the ground. 70% of the native bees actually live in the ground and turn your lights off at night. It is amazing how moths pollinate while we're all sleeping. After our interview, Laura actually helped me make my own little bee home for my garden, which I'll be tending to as soon as I get home. So right there you have twigs and hollow plant stems, solitary wasps, and mason bees will actually dig out the pith inside, put food in there, lay an egg on it, and then plug it up with chewed leaf matter. Here you put some rubber band. And you can use ribbon, you can use string. It's a way to upcycle. Oh yeah. I'm just using buzzwords here, you know? Ah, buzzwords, get <laughs> it? Yeah. Here's what we learned so far. Number one, pollinators are being threatened by the climate crisis, habitat loss, and pesticides. Number two, honeybees aren't the only pollinators out there. Moths, butterflies, and flies are also big pollinators. And number three, you can help native pollinators thrive by planting native plants in your home. So, can pollinators save the planet? Yes, I mean, duh, they've already been doing it. We need to save them or we're screwed. To save pollinators, we need to do a number of things. Number one, we need to stop using excessive pesticides and herbicides that harm pollinators and the plants that pollinators depend on. That's where regenerative agriculture comes in. Regenerative farming techniques like no-till farming and cover cropping are natural solutions to reduce pests and the application of pesticides, therefore allowing pollinators to thrive. Pollination supports the production of 87 of the leading food crops worldwide, which generate an estimated value of $235 to $577 billion a year. We also need to implement policies that protect our pollinators. A good example of this would be the post-2020 biodiversity framework from COP15, which calls for the reduction of pesticides globally by at least two-thirds by 2030. And last but not least, we need to create more spaces for pollinators to inhabit. That means letting nature do its thing. Keeping patches of wild native plants in your yard or purposefully planting them can provide habitat and food for pollinators. And if you're growing your own produce, the pollinators can help you too through pollinating them. You can also leave things like leaf litter on the ground or even leave dead trees standing when it's safe to do so to provide shelter for native bees. And if you're scared of bees, flies, or moths, well, I can't tell you not to be scared of them, but you also could help them out a bit. Just remember, we need to save them all. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some gardening to do. I feel like I'm an astronaut right now. It's like, 
jumping on the moon. Let's go get some bees. 